Stein from Yard to Trough, and our two speakers that we have today are Lisa Orgler and Gary Wittenbaugh, and you're going to get to hear lots of wonderful information from them. Uh, and just reminding you that this is the first part of a three-part webinar series, so please feel free to tune in to the next two webinars. Also, a uh, request that if you are not yet a Master Gardener, to consider becoming a Master Gardener by attending the training this fall at one of the many sites across the state. Uh, the training is going to be offered starting in September, and it's at over 30 locations around Iowa, so you've got a lot of options for where to take it. In terms of the webinar overview, we're going to learn about theme gardens from Lisa Orgler for 55 minutes. We'll take a five-minute break, and then we'll jump over to trough gardening with Gary Wittenbaugh for 55 minutes. I just wanted to point out a couple tools for you. One is that in terms of technology, if you would like to zoom in on the video camera and make it full screen, please double click on the little video, and we'll try to remind you to do that when we are doing a demonstration and want you to see um, what's going on. And then the, the other thing is in terms of handouts, we've got a few handouts here for you that include information, both from Gary and from Lisa, and we've also got the evaluation, so please, at the end of the webinar, please give that evaluation to your coordinator. And the unfortunate thing about recording this today is that you can't ask a question of our speaker today. However, you can email them. We've got their contact information both on these handouts and also within the presentation, so please feel free to contact them. I know they're really passionate about these subjects and would love to hear from you. And the last thing before I ha hand it over to Lisa is a reminder to record your hours. Uh, this is a little screenshot of the Iowa Master Gardener Hours Reporting online form. Please go to it and just write down that you attended this webinar and got two of your continuing education hours. Wonderful. So I would love to hand it over to Lisa. Thank you, Susan. Well, hello, everybody. This is so exciting. I'm excited because Gary Wittenbaugh is actually sitting behind me. You can't see him, but it's kind of neat having him in the room, too. Um, he gets to listen to me first, and then we get to learn about fun troughs afterwards. And maybe you can even apply some of the things we talk about in the theme garden presentation to some theme troughs also. That would be fun, like fairy gardens and things, which would be fun. So what Susan had mentioned is that we will be talking about theme gardens today, and a process that I developed while I was working at Ryman Gardens was um, a process that you can develop a theme garden about anything. And and actually, we'll just go through the slides, and we'll talk more about that as we go through that a little bit more. First thing I want to mention is that a what a design concept is, or what a design theme is. Basically, what that is is the element that holds the whole design together. So um, two things we're not going to be talking about today are client programs and site analysis. That's an important aspect of landscape design. And I'm mentioning it on this image here um, to show you how they relate. The design concept actually holds both of those elements together. Um, but we won't be able to talk about them today because there just isn't enough time. But I want to make sure you understand how important it is to know what the client wants and then also to look at the site to make sure you would incorporate the positives and maybe even work with some negatives of the site if you need to. Okay, so let's talk about what a concept is. Basically, it's the general idea or notion of your design. It's basically the idea that combines everything together in your design. It can also be called a theme. One thing I like to compare it to is a t it's like a term paper or a topic paper when you're writing a paper. Basically, you always have a topic. So if you're writing a paper on Thomas Jefferson, you like to have that paper support that topic. You're probably not going to have a paragraph on Griffith Buck, for instance. You're probably going to have it all focused on Thomas Jefferson. So when you are developing a concept for a garden, it's the same idea. You have your concept or your theme, and then everything in that garden relates to that theme. So of course, themes can help create lots of things in your garden. It can be focused on just one planting bed. So in this case, this planting bed maybe has a purple theme or maybe even a sage theme, a salvia theme. It looks something, something like that. But it just has one theme. Or you can focus on just a garden room. So maybe it isn't just one particular bed, but it's an area. So maybe it's your deck or your patio area, or in this case, it's a lounging space. So you can have a theme in just one area like this if you like. 
Or you can look at your entire landscape and have a theme for the entire plan that you're creating. At Ryman Gardens, we actually had a theme for the entire year, for the entire garden, and then we would have sub-themes within that larger theme for each of those planting areas. And they still do that today. And it's fun when you go to, you find out what the theme is, and then you go to each of the sub-gardens to find out what the sub-themes are. So it's kind of a neat story as you walk through Ryman Gardens. But it's a neat process because you can do it in your own landscape also. Okay, so why have a theme? I've already mentioned this earlier. You want to focus your design and, and have a reason for why you're doing things. The biggest thing, though, is it helps in the selection of materials. There's thousands of plants, there's thousands of types of stone and hardscapes and all kinds of things that you can do. And I see a theme as a funneling system. If you have a theme, it actually kind of narrows down your choices. And I, I like to tell, use the example of a birthday party. So if I tell someone, let's have a birthday party but not have a theme, I think it's more difficult to plan that birthday party than if I say, let's have a ladybug birthday party. Now all of a sudden, all your ideas start spewing out of your head because you have all these great ideas about ladybugs and insects and all these things you can do. So a theme, you know, whether you're designing or, you know, or creating a birthday party, a theme also actually helps you make more choices. It seems ironic because it seems, it seems like it could be limiting, but it actually opens up your mind and it actually helps you come up with more ideas. The other cool thing about a theme, too, is that it helps you tell a story. I love it when a garden has a theme or some kind of focus to it because then you can, when people are walking through the garden, you can release or tell people about that story, which is really fun. Okay, a theme helps us choose many things. So we're designing and sometimes we struggle with some of the things, um, some of the selections we need to make. And one of those is colors. What color should I start with? Sometimes people will just choose their favorite colors. But if you're working with someone else on their design, a theme can help you choose maybe a particular set of colors. It also helps you choose structure. And basically, these are the shapes and forms that are dominant in a garden. And we'll talk more about that when we get to structure. Plant materials, again, thousands of plant materials. If you have a theme, it actually helps you narrow down those choices once again. And we'll be talking about all of these throughout the presentation. Hardscape materials, so these are all non-living things, anywhere from paving to pergolas to trellises to gazebos. Again, that theme helps you make those final choices. And then things like furniture, um, garden art, all those types of elements also, um, it helps a lot when you have that theme. So before we get to all those elements, the first thing I'd like you to do in your areas is to talk about what are some possible, and I wrote traditional design things that you can think about right now that you have seen in other gardens or maybe that you have in your own garden. You can either talk with a partner or if it's a small enough group, depending on your site, you can talk about it as an entire group. But think about what types of design themes you've already seen in gardens or maybe you have in your own garden. And I'll give you a, a few seconds or, or a minute here to, to talk about that. So hopefully you thought of some fun traditional design themes in your own garden. I am going to ask Gary Wittenbach because he's snuck in over here. I know you obviously uh, have trough gardens, but what is the, I know you have another type of garden in your uh, garden. Conifers. So conifers. So that would be a per perfect traditional, I don't know if it's really traditional for a lot of people, but that would be a great theme for a garden. And hopefully you came up with a lot of neat ideas too. I'm sure you did. Some traditional rose gardens that I came, or some traditional gardens that I came up with. One is a rose garden. That's very traditional. Uh, moon gardens, which would be either I mean, moon gardens are a couple of things. Either they can be all whites and silvers, or they can be uh, gardens that actually bloom in the evening. Uh, cutting garden would be another traditional garden. Vegetable gardens, um, also things like herb gardens, butterfly gardens, hopefully those children's gardens. Hopefully those are some of the things that you came up with. I don't know if Susan have, uh, has other ones that that you came up with that that I haven't thought of yet. We can come up with the next question. 
you can't think. So those are traditional themes, basically. And those are ones that we see all the time. Another type of um, traditional theme would be pulling a design style from history or from another culture. So in this case, I, I put a Japanese garden on here, but it could be a French garden, um, an Islamic garden. I'm trying to think of all these different gardens that you can have. But different gardens from a diff you can look at different cultures from around the world and then and then um, borrow those elements from those types of gardens. I know that the demonstration gardens across Iowa this year that most of the crops they're growing are from the Americas. Oh, so I guess that's neat. another that's garden neat. theme that you could use. I love that in terms of planting, but also in terms of crops. I love that. Excellent. But there's a lot of fun ones that you could think of. So of course, what I'm going to be talking to you about today is beyond the traditional ones. We, we've seen the traditional ones and they are fabulous, but I'd also like to teach you a method to develop concepts around even non-related garden elements. And that's kind of a fun little process to go through. And we'll, like I said, we'll be focusing on that today. So now I want us to think about some out of the ordinary possible design themes. Now, you may be thinking, what does she mean by that? What, one thing I like to, to ask when I'm giving this presentation live is, you know, what, what are some of your hobbies? What are, um, where are some places you've traveled? What are some of your favorite books? Those types of things. And can those elements be a garden design also? So I'm going to put Gary and Susan on the spot and see if they've, if they have, just give me All another. All the plants from the Rocky Mountains. All the plants from the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> That's great. A Rocky Mountain garden. That's excellent. Do you have a hobby? I guess I've got a, Hobbies other than gardening? Yeah. Um, I guess those hobbies would include cooking and bicycling. Bicycle, yeah. So we can have a bicycle garden. And that is interesting because I have an example of that here. Or, in maybe, or maybe I could choose my favorite food. Yeah, you that could, could be. What's your favorite food, Susan? Uh, we can just say lasagna. lasagna mm -hmm. You know what's funny? I was actually thinking that. So we can have a lasagna garden. So what I'd like you to do now in either in small groups again or depending on if you have a small group as for your site, you can talk about it as a larger group, is to think about some non-traditional themes. And they can be related to gardens like Rocky Mountain Gardens or not related to gardens at all. And think about some of the things that you collect. Like I said, mention, um, like I mentioned some places that you've traveled to. Some place that you just really love, maybe there's a person in your life that you want to have a wonderful garden about, like your grandkids or something like that. And now, so just take a few minutes now and think about some maybe non-traditional or some out of the ordinary themes that you could do a garden around. Okay, I hope you thought of some really fun themes. We were speaking a little bit during our break, and Gary actually mentioned how, did you say you collect the rocks? He collects rocks from different places that he visits, and it would be neat to make either a special rock garden or garden, rock gardening area where you would include those rocks. And I also saw a shell one like that also, which is kind of fun. But you can do all kinds of neat things. But let me show you an example, some examples of some out-of-the-ordinary ones that I just, pulled from my favorite Pinterest site, <laughs> which is mine. No, no, no. <laughs> I just love going on Pinterest and trying to find fun different theme gardens. And um, some of these are some that I just found or, or created in my head. This could be a lemonade garden, so basically yellow plants, maybe with white flowers kind of mixed in for ice cubes. Um, you can even do a pink lemonade garden if you want to. So much more fun calling it a pink lemonade garden versus just a pink garden. Uh, this was a pom-pom garden. Now, this is just pom-poms in the tree, but I also imagine having a lot of plants that have sphere-type shapes for the um, tops of them, like alliums. Um, another one would be um, snowball viburnums, those types of plants where you can have a lot of plants with round sphere uh, flowers. So that might be kind of fun for a pom-pom garden. This is a bird garden. So you can have bird houses and obviously bird cages, but you can also plant 
um, or install plant materials that attract certain birds if you want to. So you'd have the, the actual birds coming to visit your garden, but then you would have fun props to put in there also. A cowboy garden, and I actually I thought of more after I created this, but you know, more of the rustic look on the, the first slide. And then you'd have some old furniture that, in this case, they made some cool benches, and then boots. And then I saw a really cool slide that I could not fit in here of those big fire pit cauldrons. I don't know if you, they're like the tripod with the big thing that kind of hangs, the big cauldron that hangs, and you have the fire inside, kind of like a cowboy camp out. So that might be kind of fun, too. So you can do kind of fun things with that also. And then Susan had mentioned a bicycle garden, which I thought was funny. So I actually found this fabulous site that had lots of different uses for bicycles. And this was a garden gate. And then this wonderful bench was created out of bicycle tires and rims. And then the garden at the top I loved because it reminded me either of the wheel of the bike or kind of a racing, you know, a racetrack or, or a you know, way that you would ride and you would kind of go into that circle. Kind of remind me of just bicycles, so that idea of that circle or that, that spiral. So those are just some examples of out of the ordinary gardens, and I'm sure you came up with a whole bunch also. Now what I'd like to do is just go through the process of how you would create an out of the ordinary theme garden or any kind of theme garden. These are the five steps that I follow when creating a theme garden, and I'll go through each one of them over the next you know, half hour, 40 minutes or so of the rest of our presentation. Uh, the steps basically are picking a theme, we're going to brainstorm, then we're going to research, we're going to take all these ideas from these brainstorming and research lists and we're going to translate them into physical things like the furniture and the colors and the plants. And then we're going to create a plan at the end. And I have this little blue box off to the left because when you're developing a concept or a theme, it's always important, like I had mentioned in the beginning, to include the clients. Um, what they want, of course, and to, and to include what the site is telling you. So if it's a shady garden, obviously you want to have shade plants and those types of things. We're not going to be able to talk about those things today, but I want to make sure you don't forget about how important those are. So let's talk about themes first. When you were brainstorming about your themes, it probably was easy to come up with the, the traditional themes, but maybe not so easy with the non-traditional themes, because it's hard for us to think in that way, because we always want to go right back to gardens. But I always like to encourage you to think about some alternatives. Maybe you can create a list for yourself like this, and think about, you know, what are your favorite things, your collections, your favorite colors, your favorite, you know, books and actors, and favorite restaurants or um, favorite sayings or words or people. Maybe you like a certain artist or an art style. You know, whatever that is that you want to express through your garden. If, you know, if you're an artist and you're excited about something and you want to express that through paint, theme gardens are a great way to express your ideas through plant materials and hardscapes also. That's why, that's why I love this process so much. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the process and I'm going to be the client because it's the easiest for me to do it that way since I'm here. <laughs> and what I'm going to do now is answer some of those questions about themes so we can come up with a theme for a garden and that we'll go through today. So some of the things that I would answer in terms of those questions were, um, one of the questions was favorite foods. So my favorite foods are ice cream and peanut butter. I actually like lasagna too, like Susan mentioned earlier. Uh, but ice cream and peanut butter probably top it, and when you put them together, that's even better. <laughs> that's the best. Um, I also like bright colors, which I'm actually kind of thinking I should have wore brighter colors today. I'm wearing black, but uh, I actually do like fun, bright colors, so maybe I would want that incorporated somehow in my garden. I love Europe and the East Coast. I like more of that traditional look. I like traditional gardens, you know, old brick and, and those types of things. I do like photography. I'm not great at it, but I do enjoy it, so that might be something to consider for a theme garden. Love my kids, and I always tell people, you know, this is very common. Now, you sh either you would want a garden about your kids or grandkids, or if you're working with a client, they will often say to you, oh, I love my grandkids. Can we have a garden about my grandkids? So that's just something um, fun to think about and how you could, you know, develop a theme garden around children. I also love garden history, and I love, of course, flowers. We all probably, not all of us, but a lot of us love flowers. Uh, and for garden history, you know, I don't think it matters for me particularly a certain area or a certain decade. I just like studying gardens in the past. I do like chickens. I don't collect them, and I always tell people don't send them to me necessarily. But I do like the idea of chickens and how fun they are, and I like the idea of, of farms. 
And then I also like textiles and patterns and material and those types of things. So this would be a list that I could potentially start thinking about and what, how, what kind of gardens could I do out of here. So my next list now are going to be possible theme gardens from that list. So I can have an ice cream garden. I could have a peanut butter and jelly garden possibly. I could use, um, because of my, my love of history and the East Coast and, and the traditional garden, maybe I would do a formal French garden, but maybe use Iowa natives and throw a little bit of spin on it. I've always wanted to do a formal garden with Iowa native plants, which would be fun, or prairie plants. Uh, maybe a photo garden for my photography habit that I have that isn't that great, but I still enjoy it. Uh, an Am garden. So these are my kids, Adam, Amanda, and Sam. And I always kid around before Sam was born, I called this the A garden, and then Sam ruined it because... His name starts with an S, so we always laugh about that. But they all have A-M in their name, and that was not planned. I'm not sure why that happened. So maybe I have an AM garden that kind of, you know, kind of celebrates who they are. One idea would be a cutting garden with bright, crazy flowers. And that's a fun theme garden, but one of the things I love doing is trying to pick themes that aren't so close to gardening, so then it makes it a little bit more fun. But this could definitely be a fun theme garden. A chicken garden. Of course, we all need chicken gardens. And then a gingham garden, so that relates back to the textile. So you can do a paisley garden, you can do a striped garden, you can do a polka dot garden, you can do all kinds of fun things with textiles if you wanted to. So what I'm going to do today is I am going to pick, I, what I feel is the most difficult one on that list. I, when I give this workshop and we're brainstorming together on themes and we develop them as a group, I always, I always encourage the group to pick the most challenging theme because I think it really shows how the process works when you do that. So I'm going to use peanut butter and jelly sandwiches because that is the farthest away from gardens that we can possibly get. And I think it really will show you how the process evolves. So let's then go to step number two. So step number one was pick a theme. So ours is going to be peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And then the second step will be brainstorming. And of course brainstorming is just as it sounds. It's just generating a list of ideas around one topic you just write down whatever you can. There are no bad ideas. You just write down what you can. By yourself is okay, but if you're with a friend, like I have two friends here, <laughs> I can, we can write down as many things as we can. We don't need to do that because I already made a list on the next slide, but I would make as many lists as possible. If that list is not long, you will struggle later. So I would encourage you to move beyond 15 words if possible. What, and again, nothing's wrong, so you just write down what you want. So for instance, here is my brainstorming list for peanut butter and jelly. I was just sitting at the computer and I just started writing down things that came off the top of my head. So, you know, things like peanuts and I've got grapes. You can see things like colors, purple, um, brown and orange. I've got oil and jars and I've got glass and you'll see things like vineyards in there and strawberries. And then, of course, I talk about knives and spoons and um, sandwiches and cutting them on the diagonal. Um, and then I had questions like, you know, who created peanut butter, who created jelly, and those will be answered in the research step, which is number three, so we'll get to that later. And, you know, things like celery sticks I have on there, crackers, let's see, milk, and then I start, you know, saying things like Smuckers, Peter Pan, Skippy, Goobers, you know, different brands. And again, um, this, is where, this is where I would ask you, too, or is there anything else that you would add to this list? I always forget something, and... Um, and just maybe just take one, maybe just take five seconds here to think about what else would you add to this list? What do you think of peanut butter and jelly that I'm not including on this list? And hopefully you said a few things. So I, I know it's one thing that I miss that people often mention is bananas. And then, oh, I, I guess I do have milk. Sometimes people will say milk, but I did get milk on there. And maybe you have other things, too. So I would add those things to this list. So the next thing is research. You may be wondering why we're doing both of these steps. I actually had someone ask me, well, why does it matter that I do brainstorming before research? Um, the reason you do brainstorming before research is because brainstorming, to me, is the emotional words that you're going to come up with. Things like... Um, what was on that? Um, oh, so a sandwich is cut on the diagonal. I would not come up with that through research. That's going to come because of my own experiences and my own emotional connections to that object. So it's really important that you brainstorm first and then you do research. And research is basically just finding out a little bit more. You want to dive into your topic more. So for instance, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, yes, I probably know enough to make a nice garden. 
But I can find out more. I can find out the history of peanut butter and jelly and find out, you know, where everything originated and how old are each of these elements. So what I'd like to do then is do some research. I won't read through all of this, but this is, I just went to the Smucker's website. I mean, you can go more in depth and go to the library or open a book. I was just keeping it simple for myself. But what this does is it makes that list longer. And you want to make that list as long as possible. And you'll understand why when we get to the next step. It's a lot easier to develop your garden if you have a lot of ideas to draw from. So when I did this research, which wasn't a lot, I just went to one site like I would mentioned. But it, it gave me some history about jelly and jam and how it came from the Middle East way back in 1095 and 1097. Uh, jelly came to America and they, and they had to preserve, um, they did preservation of fruits with honey, molasses, and maple sugar and those types of things. So that's kind of fun to learn about. Peanut butter was invented in 1890, and it was not by George Washington Carver. A lot of people say that or think that, but it was actually um, invented by a St. Louis physician. And he needed uh, easy-to-digest, high-protein food for his, for his patients, so he developed peanut butter, which is neat. Uh, I always love asking this. Do you know where sliced bread was invented? Does everybody know that in this room? <laughs> it was invented in Iowa. So sliced bread, the sliced bread machine was invented in Iowa by O. F. Rawetter, and in 18, oh, I'm sorry, not in 18, in 1927, it wasn't really popular at first because the, the bread would actually flop over. There wasn't a nice way to package it, so it took, what, maybe 10, no, I guess a year later, um, a person in St. Louis actually invented a better packaging system and then it became more popular after that. So sliced bread, believe it or not, before then we had actually had to slice our own bread, which I always think is funny. But sliced bread was invented in Iowa, which is cool. And then in the 1940s, peanut butter and jelly actually came together. It was thought that in World War II, peanut butter and jelly were given separately as rations in the war and to make the peanut butter more palatable, which is hard for me to imagine how can you make that more palatable, because peanut butter is always pretty fabulous already, but with jelly it is pretty good though. <laughs> so, to put, so to make it more palatable, they put jelly with it. And then after the war, supposedly sales of peanut butter and jelly actually skyrocketed, and that's when more and more people made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So World War II was kind of the start of that. So I want to give you all this information, even though I know we're talking about themes, and now all of a sudden we're talking about peanut butter and jelly, I need to give you this information because this is what we're going to build our garden on now. So I want to make sure you understand where that information came from. So when you have your brainstorming and research list together, hopefully you have lots and lots of ideas now to build your garden. This is actually at Ryman Gardens. This is when we were doing the theme garden or the theme year for the 150th anniversary of Iowa State. And um, you can see we had pages and pages of ideas for brainstorming and research, which was fun. Now step number four, it's actually the longest step, but it's really fun and it's a, it's a really important step. Basically what you're doing is taking all those words and now you're actually creating physical things with them. Things like color, garden structure, hardscape furniture, ornamentation, plant materials, etc. So we're going to go through each of these right now and we will start talking about how we use those lists to make each of these things. Um, and I'll go through these pretty quickly, but how, so we're going to talk about color first. And what I like to do is start to go through these brainstorming and research lists and start looking for things in these lists to tell me where, what colors can I use. So I'm just going to underline them right away and show you. These are the ones that I highlighted. Possibly purple, maybe a brown or an orange color, red and white. So those are the colors that pop up. So what I've decided to do is actually use red and purple as my main colors for strawberry and grape. And then that brownish color, I'm not sure if I love that color, but that could be an, a potential other color that I can use if I need it. But I, the red and the purple are going to be my dominant colors in our peanut butter and jelly garden. So look at that. We already have the colors checked off our list, so we got that done. Some physical things, other physical things we want to think about are garden structure. Garden structure, um, that's a whole lecture on itself, and I actually do have a whole other lecture on that. Um, basically, it's about how you add form or those bones to your garden. So things you can ask yourself are, you know, will your space be formal or informal? Will your space have a shape in it? Like maybe your lawn is a circle or an oval or a square or your patios or whatever that might be. 
is your space inspired by another garden structure in, in history, like maybe French style or Japanese or mid-century modern. So those start to give you some structure to your gardens. So when we're looking through our research and um, brainstorming list, we want to look for things that might give us structure. So things like forms, styles, all those types of things. And in this case, the elements that kind of pop out to me, and you might see other things yourself, are things like vineyards. Vineyards are, to me, are a linear thing, so maybe there's something we can do with lines. We, could, we can use maybe the idea of a round shape like grapes, so maybe a round shape and somehow incorporated into our garden. Triangles, because of the triangle sandwich slices. The idea of the shape of the sliced bread, which is kind of silly, but that, that is an element. Or crackers. Crackers are usually square, rectangle, with the little holes in them. So maybe that can be an element. So those are just some possibilities. This is our research list. Some other things we can pull from here is maybe we look at New England gardens or Middle Eastern gardens or I got I underline sliced bread or maybe we look at something about the 1940s or the US military at that time victory gardens were popular so maybe there's something there with victory gardens that we can incorporate so these are some possibilities I do want to stress though that you will not use all of these I would encourage you not to use all of these these are just examples of things you can choose from for your garden um, and so things like circles, triangles, sliced bread, Middle East, all of that. Here's some examples of each of those gardens also. But I'm only going to choose one or two to incorporate into the final garden, which I will show you at the end. I'm not going to actually tell you which garden structure I picked yet, so you'll have to wait on that. But here's some examples of the different styles of the other gardens. So that's for garden structure. And here's some other, here's the shapes again that I had mentioned already that you could potentially incorporate into your garden. And you'll see these towards the end when we get there. Okay, the next thing is hardscape. So these are anything non-living. I went through the list again. I decided, okay, what can I use for colors or shapes or different things to help us figure out hardscapes? So this is one idea I had that just for fun, I wanted to see if we can come up with um, some hardscape materials for a slice of bread. Now this is very literal. I don't always encourage you to do a very literal thing, but just for fun, we're going to do that today. So let's just say we're going to create a patio for our peanut butter and jelly garden, and we're going to use a piece of bread as the inspiration. Imagine this laying on the ground. It's going to be a big piece of bread, and we're going to make this a patio. What kind of materials do you think you could use for this piece of bread? So it looks like a piece of bread, kind of, but you're using materials that you would use in Iowa. So I'm going to let you think about that and talk about it in your group really quick for just a few seconds here. And now... And I wish I could hear your answers because there's always a lot of fun answers that I get when we talk about this. But I'll let you talk for a second. Some of the answers I usually get are, you know, gravel or mulch or, you know, one of the things you can use is limestone or you can use brick. So all different kinds of things. And here's some examples of I just drew a little slice of bread with the limestone and maybe a brick crust and this is an image from Ryman Gardens that just shows those two materials together the limestone and the brick and again this is very literal you don't have to actually make a slice of bread but a piece of sliced bread but I just want to show you how you can take an element like that and create a hardscape out of it these are other examples for instance maybe we'll use our triangle shape instead so here's some different examples of how you can use that triangle shape on the ground plane and do something with brick or limestone or maybe concrete with expansion joints in there to show some fun little, or some contraction joints rather to show some really neat little joints in there. Or you can use wood, like a deck to, to do the shape that you want and then paint it a fun color, like the red or the purple that we're using. And then, or you can use lawn. Lawn is not technically a hardscape, but it is an option for a ground plane. So that is something to consider. These are some other hardscapes, fences. The spoon scent fence is a little silly, and I agree with that. But even the picket fence, the picket fence is very traditional looking, but the reason I chose the, a picket without a point is because it reminded me of the sliced bread machine. So this is an important example of, even though we're doing a silly theme, it doesn't have to look silly. It can look very traditional. So I want to make sure I stress that, that the theme helps you make choices. So in this case, it helped me choose this white picket fence without the actual points on them because it reminded me of sliced bread. 
A person walking down the street is not going to say, oh, that fence looks like sliced bread. They're not going to say that. It's really just to help you make choices. Um, and then, of course, I have the silly trellis over there, but it doesn't have to look like bread if you don't want to. So I'm going to try to keep showing you whimsical things and non-whimsical things, because some of you don't want the whimsy in your garden, and that's perfectly fine. And some of you may like that. So I want to show you a little bit of both as we go through. This is just a simple pergola for a hardscape I idea, but I made it a square one to to represent that cracker form. It doesn't look like a cracker necessarily. Again, the cracker square form is just inspiring me to choose a square pergola. Now, if you wanted to, you could take a metal, make it a metal top and then do that punch art in it and do something really radical with it to make it look more like a, a, a funky cracker. But it, again, it's whether or not you want to be more traditional or more whimsical when you're doing this. Okay, next thing is furniture. So, Again, I went to the list, and I, here's my colors, and I also pulled the idea of round and glass, and I wanted to play around with those and see what we could do. These are just images I pulled off the internet. The first one, that first chair is fun. It kind of reminds me of peanut butter, kind of flowing, even though peanut butter doesn't really flow, but, <laughs> but that's what it reminds me of. And then this middle chair is more glass. Now, these first two, you may not find anywhere. You may not be able to purchase them locally, but the canvas round chair... It is easier for us to find a round chair like that, and that reminds me of a circle, and it could be a red grape. So, again, I want to show you how you, if you keep it real simple, you can find some fun elements that might fit into that garden locally. Uh, I did punch in or, or Googled glass jar chair, because I was curious to see what came up, and this is, it's kind of funny, it doesn't look very comfortable, but it is kind of a neat chair. But what I really want to show you in this picture is the purple Adirondack chair. Because, again, your, your furniture doesn't have to be extravagant and crazy and silly. It could just be a chair painted one of your colors, as simple as that. Now, the cool thing about this Adirondack chair, it does have a rounded top, like the rounded piece of a slice of bread. So that's, that's a nice little element, too. But, again, it's just a simple Adirondack chair. There's nothing special about it per, per se. But now you can paint it red or purple, which is kind of fun. And then, of course, you see my other round chairs and other little red ones also. And again, just using red paint or we can do our grape chair. This is just a simple bench. I chose this red bench because it had the rounded top like a sliced piece of bread. And it had the vertical slats that, again, reminded me of the, the bread machine. So, again, it's very traditional, but it helped me. those elements helped me choose this particular bench because of the peanut butter connection, the peanut butter and jelly connection. The other one is just a simple bench, and this is the whimsical option. You can put jars in there and fill them with purple marbles and make it look like, you know, grapes in your jar. So, again, very traditional to something more silly if you want. And then, of course, this is just a round table painted red, but, again, the idea of the, of the grape or a red grape. And, of course, we have our peanut butter and jelly sandwich on top we can enjoy in our garden while we're relaxing. The next one is ornamentation, and basically what that is is taking elements and making more art pieces for your garden. We don't want to go over the top necessarily, but it would be fun if you can take some of these elements and then create something artistic for your garden. So one of the things I like to ask is if we have things from our list like jars, knives, and spoons, I pull these right from our research and our brainstorming list, how could you use these in your garden as an art piece? And I'm going to let you think about that for a little bit and how you would use jars, jars, knives, and spoons potentially in your garden as some kind of ornamentation. So some of the things that people usually come up with in this area is they want to make spoon art, or they, make, they like the wind chimes where they have the dangling spoons and knives. Um, sometimes people will come up with the idea of jars with lights in them. Um, and maybe you came up with other cool ideas. I'm sure you did. So here are some images. We have the spoon art, and then there's the, the jars with the lights in them. I don't know what to do with those knives yet. I just put them there. <laughs> I'm sure there's something fun we can do with them. I love these lanterns, though, because they look like grapes. So that's kind of a fun element, for at least for an event. And then this is just a picture of some different things. I have the lanterns in there. The pennants at the top remind me of the, the triangles, the sliced sandwiches, so I put that in there. The cracker wall art are the four elements in the middle. I, I see that as punch art, maybe a metal punch art, and then you would pop the holes in there. So they would look like crackers, but maybe in a more contemporary way. 
And then the planters on the bottom left, the I, I see those as being strawberries. I like that shape. So even though they don't look like strawberries, I chose that shape because they reminded me of large strawberries. And then, of course, the spoon art is in there. The jars, if you can get really large jars, you might be able to do some small planters, or maybe you can find some and whip up a small fountain for you if you can find a jar that's large enough. But you can do all kinds of fun things, and hopefully you came up with some other elements that you can create with some of those fun things for uh, garden art. So the last thing for the physical elements on the garden, or for the physical things for the plant materials for our garden would be, um, I like to choose plants different ways. Okay, so obviously there's lots of ways we can choose plants. And we, and first of all, we need to think of their cultural needs. We need to, un, we need to know, does this area, is it shady? Is it sunny? Um, is it wet? Is it dry? We need to understand all those things first. Okay, I'm not going to focus on that for this, but you need to understand those things first. Once you've narrowed down your plant list by their cultural needs, then you can start thinking of other ways to limit your plant choices. So for instance, this first one is, can you go to those brainstorming and research lists, and are there any plants on those lists? Sometimes we get lucky and there's some plants on there, usually not, but in this case we did have strawberries and grapes and celery and peanuts. Strawberries are probably the only ones up there that are more of an ornamental <laughs> use. Um, otherwise, grapes, and celery is an annual here, peanuts probably not also. So I'm probably not going to focus on the actual plants from our list, even though I'm surprised I didn't use strawberries, though I could have used strawberries, but, um, but that's not going to work for us, at least for me. It may be, you might be different. For possible shapes, you can maybe pick plants that have a strong shape that we've talked about. We've talked about circles and we've talked about triangles. Triangles are a little iffy. We could pick plants that have a lot of circles in them, like alliums, and I think I'd mentioned earlier about, you know, snowball viburnums and those types of things. But I'm, I don't think I'm going to go there actually all either. I think what I'm going to do instead is go with the possible colors instead. That's an easy way to do it. If for some reason you're struggling with making other connections in other ways, color is the easiest way. We, our colors are red and purple and that brownish color. So I'm just going to pick all of my plants that focus on those colors instead. Another way, which I didn't list up here, that you can pick plants is sometimes there's cultivars of plants that have the name of your theme. So I think in my case, I picked a hosta that was called hosta peanut. So there might be some fun plants that actually have, you never know, they might have some fun name that connects to your theme. Wouldn't that be cool if you had that? So instead I'm focusing on the colors. And my site is part shade, part sun, part shade. So I've just picked some plants that could potentially grow in that area. What I encourage you to do when you're creating your plant list, this is a small plant list. I always encourage you to create a larger plant list of a potentially maybe, you know, 30 plants or so, depending on how big the site is. And then have that list handy. So when you're doing your planting plan or on, your, on the actual plan, you have something to draw from. Because if you're constantly pulling books and trying to do it that way while you're, while you're designing, it's more difficult. But if you create your list from all your books and the internet and, and wherever else you want to look at, make the list first with your requirements. My requirements were strawberry, or I'm sorry, red and purple. And then also, of course, my part shade. And then I wanted bloom times throughout the season, different heights, all those types of things. Make that list first. And then you can go to your planting plan and kind of pull off that list. It makes it a little bit easier. Even though you may want to add plants later on, and of course, you're probably not going to use them all from your list either, but it's just a great way to start. So this is just a start of some possible strawberry jelly plants. And then, of course, I made my grape jelly plants too. So I have my purple and my red plants. And actually, I need to go back to the other one to see if I picked any here. Strawberry candy is the name of one. I don't know if I have a lot here that have names. Oh, the clementine red, that's about it. Really, there's not a lot there that have connections with the uh, peanut butter and jelly with the name. Past the peanut in the bottom left was the only one on this one that I could find. But sometimes you get lucky and you'll find some fun names. But like I said, I just focused on the color for now. And then I did pick one brownish colored plant, Heuchera caramel. Uh, coral bells, as you know, have lots of beautiful colors. And I would say they are the best ones that have that more of that brownish color. There's some other ones, like coffee, or what is it, Carrick's Toffee Twist is one of them that's a brown color. I'm not a big fan of that plant. It's kind of nice. It's kind of nice. But I think the Coral Bells 
have nicer that, that of that tannish brownish color. So I'm going to use this caramel color for my brown or my peanut butter. Oh, I keep flipping back and forth here. The other thing I want to focus on is that don't forget about neutral plants like evergreens. So even though my colors are, are red and purple, I'm going to include plants that are, I mean, green is a neutral color. So they're the blue jeans of the garden world. They're, I mean, they go with everything. So it doesn't matter if green's in your garden because just count green as a, gar as a garden color always. It's just going to be there. So don't worry about adding things like boxwoods and other evergreen plants to add within your collection because a green is a neutral, so that's okay. That's perfectly fine. Okay, and this is just basic planting design. I don't have time, unfortunately, to talk about planting design. That's a whole nother lecture again, but things to think about are form, texture, color, and then make sure you have year-round interest and to think about the site conditions, which we already talked about. Okay, so step number five is create the plan. So we have all this fabulous brainstorming and research. We've created all furniture, and we've got plant lists, and we've got colors, and we've got all kinds of cool things. So what I'm going to do now is show you two different plans that I created. I wanted to show you how you can maybe do more of a, a traditional one and maybe a, maybe a non-traditional one. So you can see kind of the, the realm of both of them. So this is my first option, and I always like to ask, you know, when you look at this plan view of this garden, what do you see that reminds you of peanut butter and jelly? So we've been talking about peanut butter and jelly and these lists. What do you see in here that we pulled from our brainstorming and research list? I'm going to give you a few seconds here to think about that in your groups and talk about what do you see in this plan from our peanut butter and jelly theme. Okay, hopefully you have some time to think. So in this room, do we see anything in there? The triangles are really strong. Yeah, the, the triangles. So the, the way the sandwich is cut, and then also in the plan view, I feel like you see a lot of layers. So the layer of the peanut butter and the jelly. Ah, I like that. Coming together. Excellent. So the the reason just I like that so she pulled up the actually Gary did you want to say anything or the no? Round table for the grape. Oh yeah, the round table for the grape. Excellent, excellent. So the triangles, I'm going to bring that up. One of the things, it, it, it is difficult to create a space with a triangle. If I were to just use the triangle for that patio, triangles can be awkward because of the angles. Now, the 90 degree angle is fine, but the other two angles make it feel uncomfortable, the 45 degree angles. So that's why I put two triangles together to make it a square instead. But I use two different materials to still emphasize the two um, triangles, but yet it's a square shape to make it a little bit more comfortable to be in. Um, and then Susan had mentioned the layering of the peanut butter. So you can see, hopefully you can see the peanut butter coral bells in there. And then I use the grape for the plants. I use the red for the furniture. So you can play around with colors in a lot of different ways. I chose the red jelly for the furniture so it pops out as a focal point. And then I use the purple for the plants to kind of make it recede a little bit. So that those weren't the focal point. But I did do the row, if you can see the rows. So I have my hosta peanuts at the bottom, and then I just kind of layer them low to high towards the back. So the back are the cybris, and then the baptisia is way in the back. And I did the rows to replicate, again, the sliced bread machine. Um, well, so, oh, and I had the boxwood on the right side. That's my, that's my neutral color, but I needed something to enclose that side of the space. So that's another, that's another lecture in itself, is how you should enclose spaces. But that's what I'm trying to do here. And then Gary mentioned the round table for the grape, exactly. And then we have a jar on the table with plants in it. And if we look at this from an elevation, which is if we were standing in front of it, it's the same design. So I'll go back again so you can see that. Same design, but now from the side view, you can see those same chairs. You can see the jar on the table. Now you can see the heights of the plants. We have lanterns in the tree to show those grapes. And then I have my little spoon art over to the left. And I had mentioned this briefly with the ornamentation before, but I want to make sure I stress again that not, not to get too crazy with the ornamentation. Try to, try to calm it down a little bit. Just kind of focus on a few things and make it important so people really notice those things. Okay, this is the second one. Um, in our second design, uh, maybe I'll just ask you again. So everyone in the audience out there, 
What elements do you see in this plan view from our peanut butter and jelly garden? I'll give you a couple seconds here again to, to think about that. So what makes this a peanut butter and jelly garden? So Gary and Susan, do you see anything? Obviously the patio <laughs> bread. <laughs> the patio bread. And this and this is very, you know, in your face. It can be potentially. This is more of a whimsical aspect of if you want to do a slice of bread. I don't always like to do things literally, but I wanted to try this. But I do want you to think about this. If you are walking into the space, most people would not even notice that slice of bread because you were seeing it from above, but most people, unless you're looking at it from a house, looking down, you're not going to see it from this view. So most people wouldn't even see the shape of that bread, which is kind of fun. I don't know if you guys, Susan, do you see anything else in there? Also the triangles repeating again, but not, but as sort of at the, oh, at the, at the corners. Yeah. So the triangles repeating at the corners. Very good. And then, of course, the colors again. So it, so let's talk about colors for a second. In the last one, I used all the purple in the planting beds, and I used the red as a focal point for the furniture. And this one, I decided to make things a little calmer, besides that piece of bread that's on the ground. Uh, and, I, and I made the furniture the purple color, but I mixed the colors in the beds instead. So I'm mixing the grape and the strawberry jelly together with the peanut butter this time in the beds. I do have a fountain to the left. It's hard. You want you, an elevation to be able to see that better, but it's a round circle like grapes, and of course the table is a round grape also, as are the planters. The bed itself, or the lawn itself, is a circle. So that's my garden structure. I decided to use the uh, the last one. The garden structure was the triangles making a square. This one, the garden structure is the circle, and you can even imagine it being a plate, and then the slice of bread is on that plate. So it's very abstract, but it gives you structure, and that's what you're looking for when you're designing a garden is to get that structure. But is the fountain the glass of milk at the edge of your plate? Oh my gosh, that is so funny. <laughs> it could be. Let's look at it. No. <laughs> I love that idea, the glass of milk. Yeah, that's a great idea. That would have been a fun idea to make that fountain more of that milk idea or the glass. So I just made it jars and planters, but you can do all kinds of fun things. I like that idea. The other thing I have, are, I have a jar, a peanut butter jar on the table, a very large one, <laughs> from Sam's Club probably. Um, and then there's lights in there. And then I have pennants in the tree instead of the lanterns to have the triangles. So again, hopefully you can see all the different heights of the plants, and, and I'm mixing the, the purples and the reds this time. So it's kind of fun to, to see how that looks in elevation. And again, even this one, which I think is being the more whimsical one because of the sliced bread, when you're looking at it in elevation, you don't see that. It still looks like a very traditional garden. So, again, I want to stress that even though I'm using a very silly theme, your garden does not necessarily have to be silly. It could be very doable. It could be very functional. The theme is only helping you make choices, and that's all it's doing. And you can add whimsical stuff if you want. I mean, that's, that's your personality. That's fabulous. So we're actually nearing the end. We have about five minutes left, or five or ten. And I actually have two more examples before um, we finish up. And the, we're going to go through the steps again. And this will be a quick one, though. This will be our, our quick theme garden. And what we're going to do now is knitting. And right now on my website, I, 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 once a year, once every two years, typically, I like to go through this process on my, on my blog. And it does take a while, unfortunately, to do it. It takes me several weeks, because I like to do each step each week. And I'm doing the, the knitting theme garden right now. The only unfortunate thing is, is I don't have the plan created yet. At that, I'm actually doing that this weekend, so you'll have to check in to see what that is. But I am going to go through all the other steps with you right now so you can see all the other elements that I created with that. So knitting is going to be our theme. And the first thing I did was brainstorm. This is just one sheet of my brainstorming list. And I got this list from not only myself, but I asked my readers to add to it. And it's actually, two, it's actually three pages long. I actually had to do some extra things later on, but this is this is a good start for a brainstorming. Let's hopefully you can see some things on there. You know, you have the sheep and the wool and the scissors and the cats and sweaters and you know all kinds of fun things for for knitting. Then I did research because I don't know a lot about knitting. I I'm a very basic knitter. I can only do scarves. That's all I can handle. So I had to do some research on knitting. I learned about different terminology. I did some historical research. Uh, I did quite a few things to learn about 
knitting and hopefully add to that list so we can develop the rest of the, um, the structure for the garden. So the first thing I did when I translated to physical form was pick colors. Now I have to admit, this was the hardest thing for me to do because knitting could be any color. Whereas, you know, peanut butter and jelly, I, the colors were there for me. Whereas the knitting, there, there, it could have been anything. So what I did was, is I did research and someone on my, one of my readers had mentioned how much they love cable sweaters. So I did research on cable sweaters and found out that they were created in Ireland, on the, Ar the Aryan Island, so I hope I got that correct. And so I based my colors on that. So the colors were based on the wool, the white, the stone of Ireland, you know, they use the stone fences, the water because they're on the ocean, and then the purple reminds me of the cool air. That the reason they're, they're, they developed the cable sweaters is because they're thicker and heavier and they keep you warmer. So that's how I got these four colors. I could have went to a lot of different directions. I could have went to, there was some history on some early knitting found in Egypt, and there were some earlier colors that were red and white, and there was also another reference to a blue and white sock that was found. So I could have went that direction also, or I could have went with fun, bright colors like pom-poms, and I mean, there could have been all different directions. So you, could have, you can go any direction that you feel comfortable with with your theme. I just went this direction with knitting. Uh, for structure, so structure again is giving that shape and, sh and that strong form to your garden. Um, these are some of the structure elements that I found as I did my research with knitting. A lot of these are actually stitches, so basket weave stitches, diamonds, cable, honeycomb, and then of course lace. I also took the idea of the yarn ball, so that round circle again, and then the idea of loops, and then knit and pearl rows, and then the Irish countryside and having that informal look. So these are some elements I could potentially use. I haven't done this yet, so, but these are some ideas that I'm considering. So for hardscapes, I looked at different kinds of paving patterns. Uh, what's cool is a herringbone pattern, which is the first pattern, is, looks like a cable knitted pattern, which is perfect. A diamond pattern you can use with either concrete and lawn, or you can do it with brick and lawn, or stone and lawn. Uh, maybe this loop pattern could maybe be, I would say imagining it be concrete and then etching in the loops. And that could be a fun design, again, if you're doing the more whimsical end of it. And then a basket weave pattern to represent that basket weave knit pattern, or that neat, that pattern, no, what was it, basket weave knit stitch. <laughs> um, you can also go that direction also. Um, this is a pergola that I actually found online. It's this neat metal pergola. It's actually kind of a rusty metal, but it reminded me of a yarn ball with the threads going across, but this is actually thread. This was actually metal, so that was fun. And then some possible knitted garden walls. The one on the left I actually found um, in an image in Ireland, I think it was, or in Europe, and it's basically stone that's stacked on the angles. It looks like a chevron design, but it reminded me of cable, but it also had that Irish connection, which was kind of fun. And then the one on the right, I imagine being metal, and then making loops, like yarn loops, and then making that a fence or a wall also. Um, the next thing was furniture. I actually did some research, and I think I found all of these online, which is amazing. I found some really cool um, chairs and tables that either reminded me of loops, of yarn balls, or cable stitches, or some of them were actually knitted, which is fun also. And then for ornamentation, I, you can do a lot of things for ornamentation, but I decided to focus on the yarn ball or the sphere. So I looked at the, um, the lights on top are actually just little tweed, not tweed, they're like raffia type balls with, that look like yarn balls, but they have lights in them. And then I've got the succulent you know, kissing ball at the top, and then we've got stone balls in a pot, so they're not really yard balls, they're stone, but they're kind of neat, and stone spheres, stone fountains that are spheres, we've got, you know, again, you know, old branches made into balls, again, are spheres, so they look like yarn balls, so very elegant looking, but just focusing on the sphere for ornament. And then for plant materials, I kind of went all different directions, but I looked at the colors, so I focused on blue, purple and gray and white, again. Someone on my blog mentioned, oh, you should pick plants that are soft like yarn. And I didn't think about that until after I had chosen these, so that would be a whole other set that you could pick. I also picked things like lamb's ear because of the sheep connection. And then I also picked uh, cat mint because of the cat connection with the yarn, because that was on my, brains my brainstorming list. So those were some of the plants that we picked. And then I haven't picked the plant, I haven't created the plant yet, so I know we have to leave and be done in one minute here. Um, but you can take a look at my website to find out the plan 
and I will not go through this as fast. I'm going to go through this much faster. The last one is the Welly Rain Garden. It's a rain garden with a Wellington rain boot theme. So I love Wellington rain boots, and I thought, wouldn't that be fun to make a rain garden with that? So I did some research on them, and I won't go into that, but the Duke of Wellington invented it. A lot of umbrellas and puddles, English landscape, et cetera, et cetera. I created a rain garden, and then I put them in marching order, like the Duke of Wellington. And I have my circle for the umbrella, and I have my little sitting area out there, and that's my rain garden, my quickie design for my rain garden, my last one. So for a wrap-up, so when you create a theme, hopefully you can think of something really fun for yourself to create. Um, you want to pick a theme or a concept first. You want to brainstorm. You want to research. Get those lists as long as possible. Translate those ideas into physical things like furniture and plants and colors. And then finally, hopefully, you can create that plan and make something really fun for yourself. And that's it. Thank you so much. Any questions in here? <laughs> Thank you. Lisa. You're welcome. I'm going to let Susan get back on time now. I've, I've been watching the knitting garden Have develop, you? and I'm really excited to see it come to fruition. We're going to take a, a five-minute break, so please stay tuned. Feel free to go to the restroom, and when you come back, uh, Gary Wittenbaugh will be presenting. Thanks, Lisa. You're welcome.
Welcome back, everyone. We are going to get started, and we've got Gary Wittenbaugh here to talk about trough gardening. And if you have heard Gary before, you'll know that you're in for a treat. And if you haven't, then we're really happy to have you, and I know you, that you'll attend another one of his presentations. We're going to talk about trough gardenings, and in trough gardenings, actually, the, the trough was designed to display rock garden plants. Uh, this is not a new system. This was uh, in England a hundred years ago. Uh, a lot of people, when I first did this in Iowa, they thought I had developed some new type of gardening, but it's it's very old. And, and the trough gardening came. The the theme is is actually they use livestock watering troughs, uh, but they they were very big, they were very heavy, and they became very expensive. So someone came up with hypertufa, which is a I looked, tried to find a good uh, or a, uh, a, 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 a uh, word that, that hypertufa meant, but I couldn't find anything uh, really well. So what I think it means is false tufa, and, and it works out very well. And as if you notice, these are, are three troughs in my yard, and, and they, I, I kind of cheat. I, I use a conifer m most uh, Rock garden plants grow above tree lines, so you wouldn't see trees normally in a trough, but I cheat and I use a trough. There's one plant in there with a tall flower is a saxifragia, and that's sort of out of scale, uh, but you never know on saxifragias uh, until you learn of how tall the flower will be. It may be one inch tall or it may be two feet tall, so that's, that's the thing that's fun about trough gardening. Uh, troughs were basically made for alpine plants, but some people plant other things in troughs. And, and I will live with a cactus trough. There's, they're cactuses, non-hardy. You might have to bring them in, and they look kind of nice in the trough. And, and I, I can live with that. Uh, also, uh, a, the president of the Conifer Society in Overland Park, Kansas, asked me to make him a trough. And he was going to put hostas, mini hostas in it. And, and that's sort of stretching it a little. But I can live with maybe mini hostas in troughs. They look kind of nice. And that's, believe it or not, uh, even I have a little mini hosta in one of my troughs. Uh, this is the close-up of that garden. Uh, but if I catch you planting petunias or marigolds in a trough, I may come and break your leg. <laughs> The, nothing, not that I have anything against petunias and marigolds, it's just that if you're going to go to all the way work of making a trough garden, please don't plant petunias and marigolds. Just go buy a nice pre-made trough and plant, or pre-made container and plant your petunias and marigolds in that. Now, if you're going to make a trough, you're going to need four things. You're going to need Portland cement, and this is very important not premix. If it says it's got sand, rock, anything else in it, you don't want it. If it says just add water, it's wrong. You just want straight Portland cement, uh, peat moss, and perlite. Now, some people say, well, why can't you use vermiculite? Uh, I have several books, and they say not to use vermiculite. I don't know whether it's a health issue or what, but I go by the book, and I, I use perlite. And the Ingredients that I use is one, one and a half, and one and a half. And there's almost as many recipes for trough making as there are chocolate chip cookie making, but all the books that I read, even the latest ones out, go back to this one part Portland cement, one and a half parts peat moss, and one and a half part perlite. Now, I don't know if you're like I am or not, but I hate one half of a pail of anything because I don't know for sure that I've got a half a pail. And even with my bad math, if you add one and a half and one and a half, you come up with three. And so I happen to use, when I make a trough, an ice cream container. The, uh, I don't know, three quarter, whatever they come in, uh, the plastic ice cream container. And so what I come up with is three pails of perlite, three pails of pea malt, and two peat moss, and two pails of Portland cement. And that gives me one and a half, one and a half to one. Now, I said you need four things. The fourth thing, of course, is water. And how much water do you use? Just the right amount. And that can vary from how 
much moisture as in your peat moss. And, and what you want to make it add enough water to make it about the consistency of cottage cheese uh, or grab a handful after you have it mixed up with the water in it and if you can squeeze it and get three or four drops of water out, that's the right amount. If you get water stream out, you've got too much water, add a little more hypertufa mix to it. Or if you don't get any drops of water, add a little more water to it. And I like to screen my peat moss. If you've ever worked with peat moss, you'll find quite a few sticks, big chunks, and so forth in the peat moss, and you don't want that in your trough. It may uh, ball up, cause a big hole or something. So I screen my peat moss. This is a screen I made. It happens to be the size screen I had in the garage in the two befores I found. And it's, it's half inch hardware cloth, and most of you know what hardware cloth is, but it's half inch hardware cloth, and I screen my peat moss through that hardware cloth, and you can make it Bigger is better than, than this size here, but this is the size I have, and bigger would be a little bit better. And the reason you screen it is that's what you get once after you screen it. Uh, you don't want that stuff in your trough, so you put that in your uh, compost pile, and, and uh, it lowers the pH of, of whatever compost you're using. So that's the, the reason you, you screen your, your peat moss. <clears throat> and, and here's an example. Now, you don't need three pails. You can do it all with one pail, but as a group of master gardeners, I know master gardeners visit when they're doing anything. So if you have five or six or seven or eight master gardeners making a trough, have one person count so you're sure you get three pails of peat moss, three pails of perlite, and it's almost always two pails of cement is not too hard. Now, there are systems, and I'm sure you can come up with systems that you can remember besides counting. This is what Cindy Haynes does. She puts the cement in the middle, three pails of perlite around, and three pails of peat moss, so she knows that she has the right uh, for am amount. It's, it's easy to remember two pails, but did I put two pails or did I put three pails of perlite in? So this is what Cindy does. And, and if you have a group, and, and sometimes I have a group, I make everybody work. Regardless of age, I make everybody work, whether they're, they're gals or uh, little guys, I make everybody work so that they get mixed. So this happens to be Cindy Haynes and her little boy Jackson. <clears throat> and whenever you're making a trough, be sure to cover everything in plastic. If you don't, you will have problems. Uh, the first one I made, nobody told me I should put plastic down. I put my, made my trough right on the ply board table that I had set up, and it took me about two days to get that trough off the ply board. So I've made all the mistakes. If you have a question, call me. I've probably already made the mistake. Uh, email me, and, and I'll be glad to answer it for you because I've probably already made the mistake. <coughs> now, I have used Paula Flynn as a model. She's much better looking than I am, so I don't use myself as a model. Uh, you, and you can use anything for a, a mold. And, and I'm going to pause here a little bit and let you talk about yourself and see what you have in your house that you might come up with a mold. And I will give you a clue. Regardless of what you come up with, be sure the sides are tapered. If they're not tapered, it comes out of the mold. Extremely difficult. There again, I speak from experience. The first few classes I had, I let them bring their old mold, and I don't do that anymore because they brought straight-sided things, and, and that's not good. So I'm going to pause and let you discuss just a few minutes what you have in your house that you might come up with that could be a mold to make a trough. And it can be almost anything as long as it's straight-sided and it will come out of the mold. Now, I hope you have come up have come up with some different... Uh, type of utensils that you could use to, to uh, be a mold for a, a trough. And you can use almost anything. We've even used, we found a, a baby's bath at a secondhand store, and we used, Paula has used the baby bath as, as a mold. And there again, regardless of what you come up with a mold, be sure and put it in plastic. If you don't, you will lose it. You'll probably have to chip it or bend it or something to get it out of the hypertufa. So always put it in a plastic, regardless of what 
you use or what you're doing with the hypertufa, be sure the hypertufa touches plastic and not the, the metal. Then to start, <clears throat> after you've mixed your hypertufa and, and got it everything right, you cover your container with about an inch, and it doesn't have to be this, none of this is rocket science. Uh, you cover everything with about an inch of hypertufa. And, and you say, well, it won't stay up the sides. Yes, it will if you've got the right amount of water uh, and you start at the, you put on the top and then you start at the table and bring it up the sides. If they're slope sides, it will stay if you have the right amount of water. This is why it's so important that you squeeze and be sure you get about two or three drops of water. If it's too dry, it crumbles down the side. If it's too wet, it will run down the side. So you want to have the a right amount of water in it. Now, I like to use uh, a wire reinforcement. Almost all my troughs, I will put wire reinforcement in. You may read books where it says use uh, fibers and, and you different things like this. You may read books where you can use a plastic uh, or a styrofoam uh, fish box that you get at fish stores. Uh, and that's fine that you cover with hypertufa, but they break very easily. And, and the fibers are very hard to find. You have to go to a cement store. And I'm trying to make you use things that you can find even in the smallest town. I can find anything I'm using in Owain, Iowa or Alamon, Iowa. And, and Alamon is very small where Paula lives. And Owain is not very big. Uh, but I can get peat moss. I can get perlite. I can get uh, Portland cement, all that stuff. So any of this stuff you should be able to get very close to home. And this is just chicken wire uh, that I use as, as a reinforcement. And, and it stays very well. Uh, the thing with the chicken wire is it's, they're easy to repair if something happens. And there you have set the, the wire over the trough. So you can see, and you have about a half or an inch over the container already. Uh, and the wire fits over nicely. You, you made the form the wire. What I usually do is cut a square piece of wire and then cut the corners and make the basket any size I want. Now you want to put drainage holes in whatever you do and I use PVC pipe and you, normally I will put about three drainage holes in, in any size container that I make this way. And uh, you do that as soon as you put the wire over you put your drainage holes in. and. and uh, it's good that you clean the PVC pipe out after you get done with the last trough you made. You think you might only make one, but Paul has made at least, I think, 50. And if you don't clean them out, you push a lot of uh, hyper, the, per, or the, uh, the hypertufa mix down through it so you don't have a, a good clean hole. So you want to clean these out. And uh, you, you put the, the, uh, the drain holes in that way at that time. And not only do the drain holes give you drainage, but I cut them about three inches. I like about two and a half inch bottom, so I cut up the pipes about three inches. That way I have something to measure how much hyper 2.5 I put on the bottom. If you leave about a half inch so you can grab a hold of the pipe and pull it out, uh, you, that way it gives you something to measure so you know when you have two and a half inches uh, on the bottom. Now the problem is, how do you know I've got the right amount on the sides? And I don't like to make the sides quite so thick. I like about a two inch thick side. So what I do is make a wire and, and it's made so that it's two inches and that's a little handle. And if you, whatever you come up with, as long as it's thin and stiff enough to stick through the hy uh, hypertufa, it's fine. As long as it's about two inches uh, and two inches is a little thicker than some troughs I've seen, but I like thick troughs. It gives me uh, no problem. I, you can leave them out all winter. They don't crack. They don't chip. They don't split. Anything like that. I've never had, in, in 15 years, I've never had a trough break because of cold weather. So it's, it's, it works very well. And there's Paula measuring. And you can see it only goes in about an inch and, and a, maybe a quarter there. She needs about another inch. And that's where you'll find the narrow place or the thin places is at the corners where the bottom meets the sides and down each corner is where you're always going to find. And you want to take this uh, measure and go all the way around the bottom so you're sure 
you have enough all the way around the bottom. If it's too thick in one place, that's not so much problem because you could chip it off when you when it's uh, in the drying process. But if it's too thin, it's hard to add to it. So you want to go all the way around the bottom to be sure you have that two inches. Uh, all right. Now, how wh when do I take the drainage holes out? Uh, I like to take them out, if I make a trough, if I make it in the morning, I will take them out that night. Very carefully, I will uh, take the top, top, twist them just a little bit, and pull it out. But if I make, let's say I'm making a, a trough uh, in, the, in the afternoon, and I've got to go someplace that night, be sure, and I mean be sure you take them out at least by the next morning. And if you don't take them out, they probably will end up in there permanently. Uh, somebody said, well, what if you leave them in while you're letting the trough dry? I did that. They're still in there. I couldn't get them out. You had to cut them off so they were flush. You still have drainage holes. They're not quite as big. You still have drainage, but you want to take those drains out pretty fast. And, and how long do you leave it dry? Uh, if, if I were to make, let's say I made a trough on the weekend, let's say Saturday, and I would leave it dry Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, uh, then Wednesday, you want to, you can tip it over and take your mold out, and you'll be all right. But three days at a minimum that you want to let it dry, uh, but be sure to take the drainage holes out before then. So three days, you you want to let it uh, let it dry, and, and I would I always do mine in the garage. We have a double car garage, and we only have one car, so I have all one side that I can can do it and, and so I can leave them set and you want to be sure in, that they stay in that uh, garage for those three days in fact the dry time should be two weeks in the shade so I just leave them once I've taken the mold out I leave the dry time two weeks they stay in the garage I don't do anything with them at all now some people say well what if I want to plant it right away and you should not plant it right away. You should, after the two weeks, you should set it outside, let it get rained on for maybe 30 days or, or a couple months. And that's to neutralize the alkalinity of the cement. Some rock garden plants, it bothers them to do that. Some you could get by, but if you have a plant die shortly after you planted it, you probably didn't leave it. Now, there is something you can buy at the grocery or at the drugstore called potassium permanganate, and I have that, I think, on the instructions you got. Uh, and uh, But be sure to wear gloves. If, if you soak it overnight in potassium permanganate, and, and I usually put about a half a teaspoon in the water, and, and I've, I haven't done that for a long time, but some of the very first ones, I wanted to try it out, and it's very purple. Uh, the the uh, I have a nurse friend in, in old wine that tells me they used to use it for fungus of the feet, but they've got a lot better chemicals now, and, and you can get it at the drugstore, uh, and 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 it, uh, then you can plant almost immediately. But it's much easier to get a trough party together and, and make a bunch of troughs in the spring, early, or in the fall, late, and let them set out all winter. That's the time to do it. When when you can't really do much gardening, it's time to make. That's the time to make troughs. Now, <clears throat> there's something missing on this trough. If this is one I've just taken out of the mold, and if you notice, there's no holes in the bottom. It's not because I forgot to put the drainage holes in. It's because when you put the drainage hole, the tubes down through, you'll push some hypertufa down with you, and it's probably just maybe a quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch thick. You take a screwdriver, stick down the holes, and clean it out. Now, if you notice, almost Everything you use around the house as a mold will have a lip on it, and it leaves an impression in the top, and you don't want that. So what I do is take a, a, a mason's trowel and chip it up, and, and it roughens the top, and it makes it look better. Plus, you can get rid of that little groove that almost anything you use around the house, if you can find something that doesn't leave that groove, it's better. You just have to ch uh, chip up the top so it's a little rough. You don't want that smooth look. The very two first troughs I made, I troweled the outside smooth, and they're the worst looking troughs I ever made. They, you, you want them to be rough. In fact, I will take my knuckles and, and beat on the outside as it's drying so it, it roughens it up a little.
And, and here's the materials I always use. You always want to have gloves. There's my mason's trowel, my screwdriver to, to poke the holes out of the bottom, and, and a dust mask when you're mixing the, the dry mix. It's always good. And you, could, you don't have to have, I happen to be awfully messy, so I use farm chemical gloves, but you can use any type of glove, kitchen dishwashing gloves. Nobody has it and washes dishes anymore. Everybody has a dishwasher. But you can still buy plastic dishwasher gloves, or you can buy these latex. A box of latex gloves works out very well, and you can throw those away. <clears throat> now, you don't have to use a container. You can make some boxes. And, and uh, I'm going to pause here and think of what you might use to make boxes out of. I happen to buy a, a four by eight sheet of plywood wood and cut it up any any size I want. But you and you don't want a trough probably any less deep than about ten inches. So if you can think of material around the house uh, that you could cut up uh, if you have scrap lumber, you can use almost any material. I'm going to pause here just a minute and let you discuss among yourselves what you might have that you could make a uh, cross out of. Okay, now to get back, if you notice my outside box, I have four sides and I have them, a bracket on each side so I can take the box apart. The inner box, I have put the brackets on the inside because you can't get at them if you put the inside box and put hypertufa. So you want to be able to get at the brackets and take them apart so that you can take that inside box apart. Now, originally, I, I didn't have the inside box so you could take it apart. I took it out about the same time I would take out the drain holes and, and slide it out very carefully. And Somebody said, well, why don't you just spray it with Pam and leave it in there the three days and it'll slide right out. And let me tell you, that doesn't happen. I had to drill a hole in the inside box, slide a pipe through it, put a chain up over the rafters in the garage, put a turnbuckle on it, stand on the outside trough before I could get the inside trough to let loose. So I don't do that anymore. I, I make it so I can take it apart. And you don't need a bottom. When you set it on the table, that's your bottom. Now, this is something I do different that I have never seen done. Some people are starting to do it now. But it, all the books I read, it said, when you get, get done, in order to give the rough texture, you should sit there with a chisel and a screwdriver or a chisel and a hammer and a wire brush and scrape and get the sides to look like a stone. And I thought, boy, I've got lots more things that I want to be doing in the garden besides sitting there and spending a couple hours making the outside look rough and not smooth. So I thought and thought, and, and this would be a good time for you to think about if you can come up with anything better than what I did. The, the first thing I tried was Calvinator Stove Company and I used to be in the appliance business, had a, before self-cleaning ovens, they, you lined the oven with aluminum foil that was very heavy. And, and so I took a roll of that. I had a roll enough to, to do one trough. And I unrolled it and squished it all up like a newspaper and then tried to straighten it out as much as I could. And of course, it was all crinkled. I lined the outside box, made my trough, and it worked great. But I only had enough for one. So then I tried regular aluminum, heavy-duty aluminum foil, and that does not work. Uh, it took me two days to pull a little teeny pieces of aluminum out of the trough. So that doesn't work. But if you go to the big box store, they have, at that time I, I got mine, they call it Hobby Tin. Now it's just flashing. And you can get different size rolls, uh, 12, 14, 16, and, and they're 10 or 15 or 20 feet long. And you can use them over again. You measure your outside box, overlap it just a little. And if you notice, I have it just a little bit taller than the box so I can fold it over. And that's very important because if you don't have it taller and fold it over, the hypertufa, when you're putting it in, will want to run between the, the, the uh, 
aluminum container and th that. Now, they have two different kinds. They have aluminum rolls and they have straight metal rolls. Aluminum bends much better than the straight metal. I know, know I had a lady call me with uh, great problems. She had gotten the straight metal rolls and it was bending very hard. And I said, yes, that's because you got straight metal and not aluminum. But she used it and makes deeper grooves. You have to make a little bit wider uh, uh, the, between the inside and outside box, but it works very well, but it bends very hard. So I, I use the aluminum, and, and you can bend it. I would recommend having gloves on, and you can bend the aluminum very well, and it works great for me. And, and if you can come up with something better, let me know. I, I just love this system. And, and if you clean it up, you can use this two or three or maybe four times. And, and the boxes I make are always fairly tall so that I can make two different size troughs in, in two boxes. I can make a tall one or a shorter one. So that it, that there again is something you, you can do. And, and there's Paula putting the aluminum uh, on the inside of the outside box. And you still need wire reinforcement, only instead of chicken wire, I use hardware cloth. It's about an inch hardware cloth. And I make a basket. And this is very important. And you're going to have to be able to use a ruler. You measure and make this basket so that it falls exactly halfway between the inside box and the outside box. So that you can put hypertufa on both sides. And it works very well. And, and it doesn't take much measuring. Just figure out how much uh, far up the sides you want it to come, and uh, that, that you add to the, the width and the, and the length, and, and then see how big, big the bottom should be. You have to cut holes in it to let the drainage tools in. And there you put that, there again, you put that inch on the bottom, put your drainage holes in the bottom, which is, is this is much easier actually than the chicken wire once you get the measurements right. And then you take your inside box, and I always put the inside box either in a bag or line the box with plastic. It comes, even though I have it so you can take apart, I still want that not to touch the hypertufa. It works out better for me. It does, sometimes it sticks if you don't put it in the plastic. And there, Paula has put hers in a plastic bag, and, and what you want to do is you, you never take the box and the plastic out at once. You tear the plastic, take the box out first, then take the plastic out. Same way with the pans. You take the tear the plastic, take the pan out, and then take the plastic out. Always take the pan out first. It will come out much easier. And <clears throat> there's Paula putting the hypertufa between the two boxes. And, and if you notice, you can see the wire between it. Uh, and this is a very good hint. The very first one I did, I was feeling so proud of myself. I had made the boxes, and I was putting hypertufa in, except I made one mistake. I put hypertufa all on one side. And pretty soon I noticed there was about three or four inches of width on one side and about a half an inch on the other side. It slid the inside box over. So I had to take all the hypertufa out slide the box back, and the secret is you put hypertufa around and around and around evenly on the, each side and on the ends and work it up, not all on one side to begin with. Like I say, I've made all these mistakes. So if you have any questions, give me a holler. And also, you want to use a piece of lath or something to tamp down as you put it in so you get it down firmly, uh, you tamp tamp it down with a, a, a lath. There again, if you can come up with something better than a lath, but I had a lath and that, any anytime I don't have to buy something, I, I had that in the garage and that works fine. Then you, you still let them dry just like you do the other ones, the three days, take the, uh, the outside off. Now, I may take the outside or the inside apart in maybe the first day or second day very carefully. And the reason for that is I want to be sure in all the time I've done troughs, I've never had it happen, that if there's a hole or something, I can repair it. It's still kind of wet. Uh, so I may take the inside out or the outside off and, and look at it. And if there's a, a spot 
I, I can I've always got the, some hypertufa left over, and I can add, just add water to it and, and uh, add it, it's, repair it. And if you see those, you can see the rough sides. Uh, I had someone come to my yard, and they swore that they were not hypertufa troughs. They swore they were hollowed out rocks because of the different texture. They'd never seen texture like that. I have a question, Gary. Yes. What happened to the hardware cloth that you put between the two? Does that get it stays? Like, this hardware stays cloth in stays there. in there. The oh. hardware cloth stays between the two. It stays between that is your reinforcement instead of chicken wire. For the other ones, it's the hardware cloth, and it stays between. So you have, in, in the rod, like I said, I've never had one uh, crack or break because of weather. However, I have had snow blowers or snow plows hit them along the driveway and knock a corner out of them. And with the wire in there, it's very easy to repair. Without the wire, it's very difficult to repair. So with the wire in there, it's, it's very difficult to repair. Or without the wire, it would be very difficult to repair. And they're not near as sturdy either. But with the wire in there, you can take the broken pieces out, and the wire will hold the hypertufa that you, you put back in. I, I might mention at this time uh, that you cannot mix a bunch of hypertufa dry ahead, uh, let's say, for two or three weeks, and say, let's make a trough. Something happens to the cement and it will not uh, uh, be as good. In fact, you probably won't be able to make the trough at all. So if you're going to make a trough, I would say two or three days you could mix ahead, but uh, dry, and then add water. But that would be minimum. I would rather do it the day I was making the trough and not have anything mixed ahead. And here's Paula. This is the fun part. It's planting a trough. What you were going to do uh, is planting a trough. We're going to plant a trough. Almost anybody can make a trough. It's not hard to make a trough, but it's very difficult to plant a trough and do it right. I have judged troughs at, at, at kind of or at uh, rock garden society meetings, and, and the the thing I always downgrade them on is the way the planting looks. And, and I'll explain that to you when we get into planting. And here's the size troughs we're going to plant today. Uh, this is one of the, in my garden. That's that's the trough there. Uh, this is a trough here that was made with that dish pan that you saw Paula using. This is a trough planted up. Uh, if you notice, I've got a conifer in each one, and, and that's stretching it a little bit because most rock garden plants are above tree line uh, uh, on that. And I had to, with my big mouth, I had to say, you know you can make great big troughs, if you, but you have to make them in place. So right away, Everybody had to have a big trough made. So we cut out the ply board. This is about four feet wide by two and a half to three feet uh, uh, deep. And this is one at Diane Dave's in Independence. I think she has two, maybe three. Uh, this is at Paula Flynn's. She has uh, four or five or six big troughs. And the nice thing about the big troughs is, boy, you can put a plus putting a lot of plants. It gives you a lot of soil area, so they winter through very nicely. And they look very great. If you notice, under maple trees, it's hard to get anything to grow. But what a great place to put a trough and, and that will tolerate uh, shade, plants that will tolerate shade, and put mulch under the tree instead of trying to grow grass because the grass will not grow. And this is at uh, Sally Mason's garden. In uh, she's the president of the University of Iowa. This is one of my students that made this trough, and they bought it for uh, Sally Mason's garden. And it was the one that used instead of aluminum, they used the metal uh, as the liner. But it made very deep, and it looks very nice. They put mostly conifers in it, and that's the that's the big trough, and it's it's very nice. They I think they had to load that from Pam's. They had to load it with a forklift truck to get it, get it moved. And it, but it looks very nice. We had the, this garden on a garden rendezvous. And you can do fun things. And I, I may pause here so you can think about this. Uh, this is a trough at the uh, Denver Botanic Garden. And if you notice, these are all plants from Pikes Peak. So you think of, about what you might do in a, with a trough as a theme trough. 
Uh, you could do Pikes Peak plants. You could do all Iowa plants that are low growing. I have a rule of thumb in my garden. Uh, I don't like any perennial or rock garden plants taller than six inches. Uh, the flower can be taller than that, but not the foliage because I do a lot of conifers and I don't want anything shading my conifer foliage. So my plants are basically very low growing plants. But uh, we'll pause here and let you think about what you could do in a trough garden for, for a theme. Okay, I hope you uh, have come up with some good things. And how many troughs is too many? You can't have too many troughs. This is Taniote Kalaitis, who is the director at the uh, Denver Botanic Garden. And he must have 50, 60, 70 troughs. And uh, I asked him, I said, well, what do you do with those in the wintertime? He said, I just leave them set there. You must remember Denver doesn't get as cold as Iowa does. Uh, I would, in, in Iowa, I would want those troughs down on the ground. Um, but he lives them set right up, right up there, and he has tons of troughs. And his wife asked me, she said, and this is something you can do. She said, I bet you don't know what that is. That's the big, tall trough there, sort of in the center. And I said, well, I'll tell you, I bet I do. And she said, well, what do you think that is? I said, that's a toilet tank. And she says, you're right. And what they did is, and, and you can do this, uh, toilet tanks, of course, have very straight sides, so they won't come out. Uh, and uh, there are other things that you can find that you can only use once, but you can put the hypertufa over that and, and make it a one-time trough garden. Uh, we have Paula, we have a cream separator with the three little stubby legs. We put little stubby legs on it, and, and it, it wasn't made a shape that would come out, but we used it one time, and so she has this really neat trough uh, that still has the cream separator in it. The, the toilet tank is still in this one. They had to roughen up the porcelain on the tartar tank because it's very slick. But you can do all that kind of stuff. You might only be able to use it one time, um, but it makes a real neat trough. It already had the holes in the bottom. Um, but tartar tanks have holes in the bottom, so it worked out very well. And what can you do with the troughs once you make it? How about using them as a temper to table centerpieces at a big function? Let's say a master gardener graduation. Uh, this was the Conifer Society meeting, the first one in Iowa in Clinton. Uh, I happened to be meeting chair, and the president was on my case. She said, well, what are you going to make for table centerpieces? I said, oh, I thought I would make a trough for each table. She said, can you do that? So there are 17 troughs there. And I'm, I'm going to pause just a minute to, to let you think about what you could do without, with, with your troughs that you, your group makes. Uh, and, and that would be a great, and then they auction these troughs off. And they got about a thousand dollars or about a hundred dollars a trough is, is what they got. And if you decide you don't want to make troughs, you can buy them. There, there's Flower Factory, Pam out north of uh, Ames has troughs. Uh, the Flower Factory has tons of troughs. There are places that sell troughs. And here's a few plants that work in troughs. Uh, this is a Androsaceae, and I'm going to go through these quickly. Uh, this, this basically is all the same plant. That's the flower. That's the foliage. After the flower disappears, it completely changes. You wouldn't know it's the same plant. And sometimes, it always does this. And sometimes, if you're real lucky in the fall, it might turn that. So that's, that's really neat. Uh, this, this is a, a plant. It fits my six-inch criteria. Uh, very, very touchy feely plant. Uh, I just love Daphne's. Uh, anything but Carol Mackey. Carol Mackey breaks up, and of course it's way too tall. So I have the very low Daphne's. Uh, Drabas are very early spring, maybe blooms in March, and I have uh, mine's already done blooming. Uh, this is my favorite blue, Jensen blue. You have not seen a blue flower until you've seen a, a spring Jensen. Uh, it, it's most blues have a little purple in them. To me, this is true blue. Uh, this works very well in the trough. As you can see, it's very tiny. It has one downfall. If it gets very hot in the summer, like July and August, it may go dormant and, and disappear. But that's all right if you've got nice rocks. Uh, 
this is one of my favorite saxifrages, and it blooms very early, has very short flowers, and it's very pretty. It works out very well in the trough. Uh, and my, maybe my favorite, favorite plant is Semper Vivums or Hen and Chicks. And, and uh, this is one in my garden, and, and you can use those. They work great in the trough because the only thing that will kill a Semper Vivum is too much water and too good a soil. And rock garden plants don't like too much water and too good a soil. And there are some very good conifers, not dwarf conifers, but miniature conifers. Miniature grows less than an inch a year. Uh, this plant probably is already five or six years old. Uh, and they're not going to be cheap because the smaller, the, the more expensive. The Pinostrobus is a good one. Suga canadensis is a good one. Uh, and this is what I do with my troughs in the wintertime. I happen to be one of these gardeners that like to push the climate just a little bit. Like I like to use five and six zone plants in my troughs and they won't stay outdoors. And I have this patio that is empty. Uh, also, Japanese maples won't grow in my climate in the ground, uh, so I have those in a pot. And they work very well. So let's plant a trough. So just, just a note to everyone, please double click on the video image and then you'll be able to see Gary even larger. Now here's the trough we're going to plant. Uh, see the holes in the bottom? And they like to have you cover the holes and they like to have you use plastic canvas. And you can get that at Hobby Lobby I like a little, something a little bigger holes, but anything I can get, and I've never had any problem. So I'll put those over the holes. And then the soil I use is about a third chicken grit, a third topsoil, and a third pea gravel. The main, main thing is drainage. You want something that drains very well. And I'm not going to say too much here. Somebody has said, uh, if you have a question, be sure to give me a call. Somebody said, well, how quick can you plant those? And I said, I don't know. I've never shut up while I was doing one. So I shut up, and I can do it in about five minutes if I don't talk. So mounding it up. And that's where I downgrade most people on their troughs is they look like they, when they get done, it looks like they belong to the Flat Earth Society. Uh, everything is flat and, and it doesn't look right. And, and I like to pick out my rocks first and somebody said, well, how do you know which rocks to pick out? You can't go wrong if you use roundy, flatty, and pointy. And this is a perfect pointy rock. And, and uh, I'm going to use that today uh, because I know I'm going to get the trough back. I always keep that, but that's a perfect pointy rock. And you use the rule, if you're gardeners, you never put anything in the center. It's always right, left, back, forward to center. Nothing, nothing in the center. And it doesn't make any difference if you go out over the edge just a little. And I, I always have to use a conifer in my trough gardens. And this is a little saxifragia. Uh, saxifragias, you have to be a little careful. In our climate, they like shade, except the encrusted ones. Encrusted means they have the little white, almost looks like they're. Uh, something wrong with them, they have the little white edges. And I like to put chicken grit around the crowns of the rock garden plants. Their crowns do not like moisture of any kind. Uh, one remember that these are high in the mountains, these plants high in the mountains, they get maybe afternoon rain, but they dry off very quickly because they're in rock. And this is a gold campanula, a very small campanula. Some campanulas are very big. And 
And this is an Erebus. It's a variegated Erebus. I have this. In fact, I took this plant out of my garden. Uh, the only thing you have to watch out for these variegated ones is reversions. They can revert back to all green. And if you don't pull those reversions out, the first thing you have instead of a variegated plant is an all green plant. So you want to be very diligent on taking those out. And here's that plant that changed colors on us, the little Androsaceae. Now, you, you know the rule when you're planting is always uneven numbers, one, two, three, four, five. But I got room for a plant here, and that would make six. Well, I'll tell you how you get around that. One, two, three, four, five. But if I put one more plant, I go one, two, three, four, five, and I don't cut the conifer, so I can't go wrong. <laughs> I thought oh, that's a trough. And, and if I can do it, let me tell you, anybody can do it. Jeff Rossi doesn't think so, but I do. I think anybody, <laughs> anybody can do it. Yourself? I'm going to jump to the next slide, which is Gary's contact information, which is also on the handout that you have. And then I'm going to go back to those points for discussion so that in your room you all can discuss these three questions. What plants are already in your garden that you can put in a trough? How can your master gardener group use this information about troughs? And what type of, how, how can your master gardener group use this information about troughs? What type of container or mold might your master gardener suggest for individual use? And also containers, molds that are same for a larger group. Well, thank you everyone for coming to the webinar today and we'll look forward to seeing you at the next one.